If I can call a meeting to order, if you would please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Bean, want me to read? If, yes. Okay. If everybody could take a minute and silence their cell phones, we would appreciate that. All right. Oh, here we go. This is Carter. Last year, we brought some GLC students and a teacher who came and shared a little bit about the iPads that they were piloting or trying out in our building. So this year, we've been fortunate enough that all of our classrooms, K through two, have the one-to-one -one initiative. So all of our students have an iPad. So this year we're presenting from the teacher's perspective. So I do have two teachers here, a kindergarten teacher and first grade teacher, who are going to share a little bit from the teacher's perspective and a very instructional perspective for you, how they're, one way they're implementing the iPads and the impact it's having in their classrooms. So some of the things they're gonna share with you is truly how having the iPads has not only multiplied them as a teacher, and it really is one of the best things I heard a teacher say was, the fact that now it's almost like having 10 of them in a classroom because as they're working with a group of children they're able to push lessons out to students in a very individualized and differentiated way through the iPads using the correct apps or different applications that they have they're also finding a variety of ways to differentiate individualize um, they're able to push out different levels of activities for students and it's all through the iPad so they're saving an extreme amount of money in budget because they're not making all of these copies. Um, and one of the things they're doing this with is a, through a program called Class Kick. So that's one of the things they're going to share with you today. So you do all have an iPad in front of you. The teachers are going to present an example of how they use this with their students. I think you're going to see it at a differentiated level so you won't all see the same thing but their students don't all see the same thing. So the objective they're reaching in the end might be exactly the same, but how they get there is very different. So I'm really excited to bring two of my very technologically savvy teachers here today who share often with their grade level and throughout the whole building. I can tell you that the program or application that they're gonna show you on the iPad is being used right now in, with all of our classrooms, but probably in different levels, depending on how familiar the teachers are, how good they're getting at it. Um, we currently have the free app, and we're hoping to get the paid application because it does have more, I guess, what we would call bells and whistles for the future. But it's, this is going to be really the instructional approach you're going to see today, as opposed to last year. You saw the excitement with the kids and how they're actually using them in their classrooms. So I'd like to introduce Josh Walker, who is one of our kindergarten teachers this year, and Sarah Fiorella, who was kindergarten last year and is currently a first grade teacher who also is a first grade inclusion teacher, so she really knows how important differentiation is. But I can tell you, both these teachers do a dynamic job every day of the personalized learning initiative, small group instruction, and differentiating for all of their students. So they're real excited to share this with you. All right, what I need you to do before we start Don't is there's a code on the board, and it will say, your iPad will say, class code, that's your class code, okay. and then it's a student name, we put you in and ask with the space? So what did you just say? So you have to type in the glass code. With the space in it? No space. No space. No space. I don't know. Okay. And then we put your names in. Uh, you got a list to put your names in? Put your name. I put your names in. Since your names are already in um, on the roster, the iPad will attempt to fill your name. So make sure it is filling in the correct name. Because if it does do that, you'll be able to just hit go um, rather than having to type out the rest of your name. Uh, so while you guys are logging in, just to mm -hmm. kind of give you a little bit of a description of what's going to happen, um, I'm going to introduce the app class kick itself and just tell you a little bit more about it. The process um, evolved with planning and implementing this app through the classroom. Um, so once everyone has the code, we'll take down the class code and we'll have a uh, stream. Wait. With the oh, so did I do it? I did it backwards. See what's on. going on? And actually, what you will be viewing up on the projected screen is what the teacher will be seeing oh, um, in real time. Um, like Lauren said, this is just a free version of the app. 
Um, there's also a pro and a plus, and the huge benefit behind those is that it allows students to track their progress and it keeps records of their own grades so that they can actually see how they're progressing um, through yeah, depending on what no, the content no, area no, we're covering is. Still. So say if it's ELA, they'll be able to Sorry. keep track of their progress in no, ELA how they're doing um, in the listening and learning strand or the skills strand, for example. Um, so once you're logged in, you'll just be on the first slide. Um, as soon as you are on the first slide, you can go ahead to the second slide. And as soon as we get everybody in, um, and we can get the second slide up on the screen, uh, we'll go ahead and move on with that. Does everyone at least have the class code entered? No, I am totally holding up the works here. <laughs> go figure. Thank you. Oh, perfect. So the nice thing about the names being filled in is uh, for me in kindergarten, uh, aside from students that have the same name, it'll automatically fill in for them so they don't have to spend uh, a whole lot of time having to type out their name, finding the correct letters on the keyboard, especially um, which I have for the students that uh, have the same name, they have numbers, so switching back and forth between numbers uh, can also be asked for them. But honestly, once they've been doing, we've been doing classic with our ELA listening and learning uh, for the past two units, so they're at the point now where I typically don't have to help any of them log in because they're used to the process and like I said, having the name fills in makes it a lot easier for them. So uh, what we have, even though it's not there now, before we went into the slide, um, up there, Sarah, can you go back to that real quick? This is what the teacher will be looking at <coughs> on their own iPad or computer. computer. <laughs> Basically, a white uh, screen that is outlined by a black box that tells me what slide everyone is on currently. So, everyone who's on slide one, nice and the arrow to slide uh, uh, over uh, to uh, slide uh, two. Uh, thanks for the directions, John. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Well, now go to slide two. So now go to slide two. Now go to so, slide two. So, yep, slide down. <laughs> slide 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 two. Right. They told me what that is. So, slide two, I can check. <laughs> Um, is there an issue displayed with the thumbnails? Okay. Real quick, on the top left. Nope. Right on the top left, display thumbnails. Left. So now, internet permitting, you can actually see exactly what somebody is doing on that slide. And say they are really writing cool. for an answer, typing, whatever they are doing, depending on what the instructions tell them for that <laughs> slide. You can live pro or track that, what they're doing, so I can see Barb has written a little bit on slide two. Um, and if you look up other points, that is where you can score and grade extremely easily. Um, you can set each slide to a specific amount of points based on what um, content is on that slide. So, yeah, I now you can go to slide two. So basically, the process in setting up Class Kit, um, the teacher prepares the assignment through the app, or they can also do it through Google Slides or PowerPoint. Uh, basically, it's a little easier to do it through Google Slides and PowerPoint because there's more you can do on those um, programs and then transfer it over to Class Kit. Um, because that allows you to set, um, if you wanted a square box with an empty space from the right, that's something that the app doesn't allow you to do directly, uh, but then you can just transfer it over easily as a PDF file and it automatically lines up each slide to its own designated slide. It'll create new ones for our, how many the uh, PowerPoint has. So if it has nine slides, it'll automatically fill in those nine. Um, once you have set it up, um, the nice thing about this is if other teachers are using ClassKick, you can share this lesson directly with any other teachers in the school. Um, all you need is their email. You can send an email. Basically, it says, um, I'm sending you this lesson to share with you and use in your classroom. They can accept it, and when they log into ClassKick, that uh, lesson gets put directly into their own file so that they can use that lesson with their classroom. Yes? So then that could be used for AIS as well? Yes, because they can also, uh, depending on how you moved it in, they can also edit parts of it as well. Um, so once the teacher prepares the lesson, this is that's pretty much it on your end in terms of instructing them. Um, basically, what happens is, I'm sorry. 
in planning the lesson. So now everything's set. All you are doing at this point is you are monitoring students and going to the ones that need help. Um, so students will log in just like you did. And as they are going, the teacher would be monitoring um, the class as a whole, like we showed you, looking for students that are maybe stuck on a question. Um, they're not sure exactly what the directions are telling them to do on that specific slide. If they're not on task, and you can see that they're just drawing somewhere. Um, and the nice thing is, um, can I actually ask, see if one of you guys can find, there is a green hand up on the oh. top right and it's basically saying to raise your hand. And you can either select raise your hand or please check. So if you'd like, if I'd like everyone to at least go up and press either raise your hand or please check. Is please check the little E? Yeah, it's a white hand on the it right side. It's a right hand. hand. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, and it says please you help or please check. Oh, please help or please check. Look, up on the screen where the pointer is selected, if that is not selected, you won't be able to select something. Oh. What's not selected? That's this, okay. the pointer? You're still trying to transfer between that. That's one of the uh, biggest no. issues still. Sorry. That's right. That little air, no. Nope. Oh. And yep. as soon as you, can you back out to the teacher view? As soon as anybody raises their hand, the teacher looking at it is going to see. If it's yellow, that means please check. That is the student telling you, I'm finished, please check my work. Donna, what are you doing <laughs> If a student has a green hand raised, that is telling the teacher, I'm stuck, please come over and help me out. Um, one thing that is really nice, and that's another thing, the teacher can directly type on oh, that so person's cool. page, so nobody else should be seeing what Sarah's typing on Donald's page. <laughs> That's awesome. So the, the nice thing about that is the teacher doesn't have to necessarily go over to that student. They can help them directly on their <laughs> iPad while remaining with the student they, they might be working with or if they're working with a small group depending on the situation. Um, another thing that uh, I haven't used in kindergarten yet, but something I <coughs> could see being used more often with um, higher grades is if you look up on the projector, there is a middle option that says allow peer helpers. That means that if a student is stuck, they can talk to one of their friends next to them or whoever's in their group and they can ask them to help them. That means their peer can directly help them on that slide through their own iPad, just like the teacher, just like Sarah did as the teacher. So that allows students to instruct each other at the same time. And that also, like we said, multiplying the teacher, having a student teach another student what they should be doing also reinforces it for the student that is teaching to them. Um, so we can go on. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna go to the third slide. Everyone can go to the third slide. This is an example of something that I have done with my kindergartners in our skill strand. Uh, basically what is going on right here is this is chaining sounds for words that they can decode. They know these sounds. They've been taught in our skill strand already. This is them applying their knowledge to basically chaining is taking a sound away. So the sound that I have underlined is the sound that they're taking away and they are replacing it with a new sound to make a new word. Uh, what you are looking at right now is not what everybody sees on their own iPad. Some of you will notice that you do not have the same picture that is up there on the screen because what Classic allows us to do is we can differentiate per student on what they see on each slide. So what you guys are seeing up on the main screen is what, a, what every student is expected to be able to do. If I have students that are showing that they are still struggling with some of their sound recognition and being able to blend a word, they will have a different screen that it has more structure and support to them so that they can manage this, it better on their own independently. Um, so this is my expectation as a class. My higher students, if some of you guys have noticed, there's nothing there in terms of underneath. There's nothing to trace. They're expected to be able to produce the picture for each sound on their own without being able to trace um, like you see up on the main screen. So if you look in uh, the top, 
Those are the directions. Student, basically students, what I did with my kindergartners, we went through just a trial uh, lesson first so they could get used to using ClassKit. Once they got used to that, they know that audio file at the top is their directions. They know that they need to listen to that first before they can get started on that slide. But that took me go, taking the time to actually just do a lesson and getting them used to what they should be doing and what should they expect when they're doing work like this. Um, some of the, if you have one of my lower students, you'll notice that there is a audio file to the left of the word. That audio file to the left of the word is a recording of me giving the sounds and blending the word so that they can at least hear the correct sounds for each one that's up there and they know they have to trace the second two because they're not changing so they're only focused on getting a new sound coming up with a new sound that they know and putting it at the beginning of the word so and like with for my higher students you'll notice there's a lot less support there and that allowed that's because those i expect to be able to do that without those supports that i have there uh, so if you want you can right now take a minute or two to listen to the files um, and if you want to even actually complete it i can go back to the teacher screen and see what everybody's doing so I'll sorry you right. so back off real quick to the looking at the whole class it's going to give you a so do your best nice so like i said it's a live feed as long as the internet's working well i can see that immediately as soon as a student completes the work and if you are finished you can go to the hand um, you can tap please check also do right make sure you switch to the pencil and not the selector or we'll let you. Oh, okay. and that also you need to be on the selection tool to be able to play audio files you really want us to record ourselves no, you, yeah, you don't have yes. to record. I, you, so, yeah, so basically the question is, how do I know just from this slide if the student correctly provided the sounds and wrote the correct picture for each sound? That is where that they are able to record their own voice on the iPad. They hit stop, it saves the file, they know to move the file to the bottom, and we don't, I didn't have it up there but you can basically move it so that they typically also put a box so that they can move the audio file to a specific spot so that I know that that audio file is them reading each sound and then blending it together. Um, one of our strategies for blending sounds together is using our arms. So for example, the word that's up there is ah, and then so that's what they would do to give each individual sound and then they would blend it together for the word hot. And so I would expect to be seeing when they're doing it, I would see them using their arm to sound out and record their own voice as they go. Um, and that is how I know if they are producing the correct sound for what's up there for each one. Because they'll typically do, I have them do about 10 to 15 of these in one lesson. Um, usually we do this during daily five where they're doing it in a small group. They have designated students that if a student is struggling, they know that there's one student in each group that is able to help them that they should go to before coming to me. Because I'll be monitoring, but I'm working usually with another group uh, myself. So, and that's where the grading can come in. So let's say um, Cheryl made a, a word, changed the sound, wrote it correctly, recorded it, has the correct sounds for each one and blends the word properly as well. Let's say I made that based, based on this, I usually have it as four points, one for each sound, a fourth point if they can blend the word correctly because I definitely have some students that still struggle with blending the sounds. They recognize the sounds, but they don't necessarily blend them together to make the word. So typically that would be, so if everything's done correctly, they would get four out of four points. So that is um, my part of the presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, and I'm also going to apologize for my quick exit. My <laughs> voice modified basketball team is playing still, so I'm gonna go. Right <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. I'm gonna show you what we've been doing in first grade and second grade.
Um, I use class kick, well I've been using it more, sorry, um, for math. We've been really trying to personalize so students learning. It's a big um, buzzword in our school this year. I use it. You can go on to slide four. I use it in math, so I'll take a simple, our simple math worksheet that we've been doing, and I'll take some of the problems that we may not have got to in a lesson, and I'll put them all in one class kit. And I'll say, you have to do this before you can do coding. You do codable, it's coding. It's a really good incentive. Um, I give the students the directions. I'm actually gonna let you do it. I give the students the directions in the first line, and then you can see I differentiate by helping the students and talking them through the problem based on their need. Some students don't need any support and they can figure out a simple math problem like this by themselves. Other students, students need that teacher help to walk them through the problem. And I can't be there for all of my students that need this support because I might be working one on one with one on one the child or working with uh, my higher level students on a higher math test. So this way, they can go in the hall and I'm still teaching them. I think it's really cool. So if you want to give this a try, I'll let you listen. I do my best acting. I close my door. I do my best acting on these things. I'm British. I'm Irish. I'm Jamaican sometimes. All the same. Can you see the that one for the audience? Um, and I just want to tell some questions. We get this a lot. 
You're just giving them more screen time and you really don't want to teach. I really want to teach, first of all. And we always talk about screen time and there's pros and cons of like letting the kids be on screen. But when the kids are in my classroom, or most of the classrooms in the GOP, we talk about um, consumption versus production. So are they consuming what they're doing on the apps, or are they producing what they're doing on the apps? They're doing class gigs, they're producing the knowledge. They're showing us their work. They're showing us, they're narrating things by themselves. Um, I like that. Instead of just so watching them, they're just they playing a game. Like so we get that a lot. We're just letting them sit on the screen. They're not actually teaching them. No, I'm teaching them, but I don't have to be there. This also works really well with um, absenteeism. Mm -hmm. Kid missed a lesson. I can give the, the parent the link. Or I mean, they don't have internet access. I can say, okay, we got five minutes. Go to your reading and come back to me. Or go to your math lesson and come back to me and tell me what you didn't understand. I just multiplied myself without having to shut down my classroom because this kid forgot who wasn't here that day and I need to catch him all. And what we're, we're seeing so far is just part of a free app? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reading yeah. app has a lot more um, things you can do. You can put the whole, like, at first grade we're working on doing the whole listening and learning on class kids. So we want to be able to combine them all so that it's like a library for us. <coughs> There's more editing tools that we think would be very, very helpful. Because it's very, very basic. You can record, I can draw on the screen, I can type things in, but I'd like to go further with it. If we, with purchase of the app, does the parent have to purchase the app then too, or it's free for them to it's access free, it? Free, okay. It's free for the parents. I mean, and you could use a free app when you're giving it to the parents. Okay. It will translate the app. Okay. Students can probably navigate this a lot better than like totally I could right now. <laughs> and it's funny you say that that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I would say that at least half the observations I've done so far this year, the teachers are using this app in their classrooms through their teaching. And it amazes me because it's not that I think anybody is struggling up there, but when I hear them saying, you know, touch the green hand, touch this, do this, you got to be on the pencil to do that. The kids, they're digital right. natives. They just automatically are doing it without a hitch. Like even at five years yeah. old, they don't have any problem oh, yeah. at all. Yeah, it seems like the older we are, we have such a learning curve mm -hmm. for us. And they're coming in ready for this. So even if they don't have an iPad at home and haven't been on this, they're picking it up so quickly. Mm -hmm. And digital like Sarah, and, yeah, and she's really done a great job saying, like, I can tell you, the group instruction and differentiation is really isn't that new with GLP. But I've watched teachers work really, really hard to manage. How do I work with this five group of kids when I've got 15 other kids doing yeah, something else? Right. It's, it's truly amazing to me from a principal perspective to watch the teacher have five kids that they're providing direct instruction, but they have this iPad sitting here in the corner, and all of a sudden, they're still working with their group of kids providing very direct instruction for those children at that level, but then all of a sudden they'll just do this, and all of a sudden, I'm watching, they're sending out an instructional tip to a child, or they're answering a child's question at the same time when they're all over the room on their iPad because it's that very live instruction. So they're truly working with five kids here, but the other 15 are getting their help also. It's, it's really incredible. This is like, I would say it's like Google Class or like Google Docs. You know, I use Google Docs in middle school and then high school, sixth and seventh and eighth grade. But it's for primary. Like, my kids can't navigate to Google Maps yet, but they know this. When they get to 6th, 7th, 8th grade, or 3rd grade, when they go up to this machine, to this machine, they'll know how to use Google Maps. They won't have to be trained for that good three weeks on how to use Google Maps. Because these operating systems are like a different language, but it's all the same language as technology. Like this link is the same no matter what grade you're going to. Absolutely. Well, I just think technology is just we going to get more. Yeah. 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 There we go. Long out.
That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's still on. Thank you. That was cool. Is that in speech? Good stuff.
So the BMA is the area's largest organization representing manufacturers in Erie and Niagara County. Uh, just to try to give you some numbers, there are 1,500 manufacturing companies in Western New York. That's the five counties in the Regional Economic Development Council uh, that kind of serves this region. We represent over 70,000 jobs, supporting nearly 25% of our region's population. And our number one issue right now is finding good quality people to work in our businesses. Who are the manufacturers that you know? Moog, Cummins, Ford, General Motors, Praxair, Dresser, General Mills. These are all the big names that you know out there. But the numbers would show 75% of all manufacturers are fewer than 20 employees. So small, medium manufacturers, one you might think of here locally would be like Mustang, little machine shop over there in the uh, Eaton. So <clears throat> when you look at this, you have to understand there are all the big guys out there and that everybody knows, but behind them are, is an army of small manufacturing companies that exist that employ the majority of the people in our industry. A couple of stats, these are hard to see, but <clears throat> some manufacturing stats that you should know. The average manufacturing worker in the United States earned $82,000 annually, including pay and benefits last year. That far surpasses the rate of pay in Erie County. The average Erie County rate of pay is about, with benefits, a little under $50,000. When you look at this as well, uh, the average worker in all non-foreign industries earned $64,000. And then if you look at specifically a manufacturer, on average, earn more than $26 per hour, which equates to a little bit more than $52,000 a year income. So very attractive, high wages, well, uh, and much higher typically than uh, the area pays in general across all industries. Over the next decade, <clears throat> we're gonna lose three and a half million manufacturing jobs, primarily due to retirement. So we call it the Grace Mountain. Um, the baby boomers are retiring and they're exiting our, our industry. So we're a product here of an issue that we saw massive reductions in the manufacturing sector over the last 20 years. And primarily due to offshoring. So a lot of work went to low cost countries. That number stopped reducing in 2008. And in the country we've been increasing our numbers. So now we're having an increase in manufacturing jobs. But couple with that, the massive retirements that are going to occur. I'm sure you guys are addressing that as well with teachers, uh, kind of seeing that come up. So, you know, finding the talent is going to be a major issue for us, and it's something we're trying to address today. Taking a loan, the manufacturing in the United States would be the ninth largest economy in the world. So, larger than every other country except for nine, and one of those would be the United States. So the GDP generated by the manufacturers in the United States are the primary economic driver of our country. So we do have a huge problem. It is a skills gap. And it's costing manufacturers in our communities and we're trying to address that. So locally, uh, we have about 67,000 jobs in manufacturing. Again, paying it on average at that rate here locally of about $67,000 a year. Uh, it is the third largest sector in our region, uh, the other one being life sciences and government. And the projected job vacancies, we need to fill 20,000 jobs between now and 2025. So where do we find that talent? It's going to be from the pipeline of the high schools, uh, tech ed programs, incumbent workers, uh, and long-term unemployed. So we have to get out there, refugees, veterans, immigrants. So a couple stats here that everybody should know. <clears throat> there are 40 million people in the United States with some type of student loan debt. Totally 1.3 trillion dollars. On average that equates to $35,000 per person that's carrying debt. Oftentimes that education they're getting will not pay the debt or have the capability to pay off the debt that they've incurred in getting their, their education. So there needs to be some type of rationalization. It, rather than just pushing people towards uh, you know, it, it, continuing their education, it's push them towards a career and find a pathway to personal sustainability where they can be a functioning member of society and live a very good living. So 
and try to reiterate that and have the communication with you, kind of a vision of where we're going here locally. And I'm gonna show a video of what a region is doing down in Kentucky that we're gonna emulate, and then we'll come back to the North uh, Workforce Training Center. skills to do the jobs of the future and quite frankly we need them yesterday kentucky fame is a great partnership for we know how to get it to the Kentucky Bank and its future 
are the partnerships that are involved with the leadership of the Kentucky Association of Manufacturers, the state legislature, our manufacturers across the state, and ACTCS. This will be a success. So the BNMA has been working with the state and we will be opening uh, the first industry-led school in New York uh, in, the, in the fall of 2018. Uh, the school is led by industry, the board of directors. It's funded through a partnership of the Buffalo Billion, through Buffalo uh, funds through the city of Buffalo, from the New York State Power Authority and uh, New York State. It's a $45 million investment. And that will go into the building itself, uh, to a surrounding manufacturing campus uh, that we will be then bring in an innovation center and become a center of excellence for manufacturing here in Western New York. We have 150 companies on board right now to start uh, employing the students on day one. So the student will go to school for two days and then go to work for three and be earning a wage of approximately $15 an hour. So kind of unheard of, but if you can't function in that environment, if you're not prepared to put in 40 hours a week, you don't take the schoolwork home with you every day. There's not a three hours of, of homework. You're gonna do everything is applied at the center. So you do all your work, you function, you do a 40 hour a week, you're drug tested on day one. That's a huge issue for us. Uh, Students think you understand that marijuana is a drug, and if you smoke marijuana, you cannot get a job working in any of these companies. Uh, so drug testing is an issue, uh, but this industry-led initiative, I think, will really bring some very unique uh, opportunities to our community. So why are we doing this? Unemployment rate is at record lows. We are basically at full employment in New York State, uh, somewhere in the realm of 4%. When you get into the city, it's probably closer to 6.5%. And then the other part of this is going to find people who are just left the workforce altogether. So incumbent workers or workers that have just disengaged because their benefits have run out, they've, they've left the workforce altogether. So we are struggling to fill these jobs and that's why we got involved with the state to help uh, develop the solution. So the Northland Workforce Training Center will focus on advanced manufacturing. Uh, what is advanced manufacturing? So what happened is those jobs that left this country or were automated were low value jobs. They were, I put a nut on a bolt and I turned it in. So that's gone overseas. Today, the work that's performed is of high value. Uh, you're working with very sophisticated machines. You saw those kids there. Uh, you see the hydraulics, pneumatics, electrical acumens that need to be done, and then you're working with machines that are worth millions of dollars. So that's how you're integrating today. You're not really lifting 50 pounds all the time. It's really operating an assembly line type of work and working in a pod uh, where you're mul uh, operating multiple pieces of machinery. In addition, we're gonna be also working with NIPA. <clears throat> the same issue we're having in manufacturing, they're having in the utility industry. Uh, they're gonna lose about 10,000 of their jobs here over the next, they have 10,000 people that are eligible for retirement right now. And they're sticking out, they're trying to pad up their 401ks and the retirements before they exit, but it's a massive fear factor for them. So the vision is for the Northland Workforce Training Center to be a premier model of public-private partnership, providing education, training, workforce development services that's industry-driven and employer-focused. And the mission is to advance economic well-being of the Western New York region by developing and maintaining a skilled and diverse workforce to meet the needs of the advanced manufacturing energy sectors. When you go into our shops, there's too many white males. 
predominantly gray hair or bald because they, they're aging out. We don't have enough women engaged. We don't have enough minorities engaged. So that will be a, a major mission of this initiative. <clears throat> we need girls in STEM education. We need to promote it. We need to advance it. We've got the tech teachers. I don't know how many girls are in your classes today. What will be the percentage? 15 to 20. 15 to 20? That should be 50%. So this gender identity roles that we are, are, are running, the culture that exists, is really going to affect uh, really our nation and our community. So we really need to promote these opportunities to everyone. And we need to educate these, uh, these students on the opportunities that exist in our companies. The partnership that we talked about, so we have Empire State Development is a funder, Bud C, uh, which is the Buffalo Urban Development uh, Center. New York State Power Authority and the SUNY Regional Foundation are training partners. We are bringing Alfred State up to run programs at our city campus. Why do we like the Alfred State model? They deliver something that's called an AOS degree. It's an Associates of Occupational Science. Your math and English are applied in these programs. So you're not going to learn Shakespeare. You're going to learn how to read a work instruction you're going to learn how to read a blueprint. You're going to learn how to communicate well with others. You're going to learn how to critically think. Your mathematics will be embedded as well. How do you measure properly? Uh, how do you work a micrometer? How do you take a reading on a component? And they spend an hour a day in, the, in their classroom, and they'll spend four and a half to five hours a day on the lab floor. Then they'll deploy on their own student projects, and then the days they're not going to school, they'll be out in the workforce with a real company earning real wages. Our partners that are going to operate the center are the Buffalo Niagara Manufacturing Alliance, the Buffalo Urban League, Catholic Charities, and Goodwill of Western New York. So we have three workforce development agencies, social service agencies, that are going to work along with us. Why? There will be intensive career counseling throughout the process. Uh, we have to track every student for three years after graduation. Uh, they have to give us permission to track them. We'll track them through their WQs, and we want them to engage with us as well when they graduate. So we can find out, are they working for a manufacturing company? And if I can track a W2 or W4, I know they're working for a company that has a NAICS code that starts with a three, they're working for a manufacturer. I'll know what their earnings are. And we'll be able to provide that data back. So this will be a data-driven initiative. But the intensive soft skills, I don't know if you heard that or if everybody's familiar with that. We find oftentimes that the professional or soft skills are non-existent today with a lot of the young people coming into the workforce. Um, you have to be ready to work shift work. The day in manufacturing starts typically between 6 and 7 o'clock in the morning. Or you're going to work second shift where you're working from 7 to 10 o'clock at night. Or you may work third shift. So, when we go through our assessments, we're going to make sure that these individuals are prepared for that. And if they're not, it's just not the program for them. So we will be targeting, we'll be coming out, we'll be recruiting, we'll be performing outreach. We're going to open up those 150 companies. We're going to open the doors not only to the students, but to faculty, administrators, and to the counselors to identify the opportunities so they can communicate the opportunities that we can offer to the students. So <clears throat> aggressive recruiting and assessment, uh, we're going to assess everybody. We need to make sure that they can read and write typically at a 10th grade level. Because you have to be at that level in order to function with the equipment that exists in our sector today. Four credit stackable training. So when I say stackable, there will be embedded credentials throughout the process. So if a student decides to leave, they're not leaving with nothing. They're not a dropout. They're going to have a credential. They'll have a document that they can take with them and say, Here's my NCRC, I have my National Career, National Career Readiness Certificate. Here is my OSHA 10-hour card that I, I'm authorized and have been uh, shown that I've been trained in proper safety practices. We'll build in uh, CPT credentials and then that will advance as they go through their education. So the SUNY provider will provide those first two years of education. Afterwards, we'll have corporate training opportunities for incumbent workers at the companies that we're dealing with to do advanced training, and that'll be more specialized. 
this is the building we're renovating. I know it's difficult to see, but this is the old Niagara Clearing facility, uh, Factory on Northland Avenue. Uh, we've gutted the facility completely. It's been abated. Uh, we're putting on the new roof structure. We got our first windows going in on the, on the building. We'll be airtight here, hopefully within the next month. We'll start pouring the concrete floors in the manufacturing facility. And it's gonna be an open environment. So you can see here is the office. This is the more of the manufacturing campus that exists. So we have 200,000, 250,000 square feet in the building here at 683. We have another 40,000 of capacity on the right. Uh, and in the whole campus, we have close to a million square feet of capacity. We will start to do outreach to local manufacturers to come and join us on this medical, on the, on the manufacturing campus. So we want to emulate what's going on with the medical campus down in the city. If you know what that used to look like 15 years ago, it's been a major trans transformation for that community. Um, and then you go over to what's happened on Canal Side and how the waterfronts come around. This will be the anchor tenant to revitalize the east side of Buffalo. And we're in the most impoverished area of our community. So we'll be changing lives. <clears throat> it's a food desert. People don't realize there's only one, two restaurants within a mile of this facility. You know what they are? The Kentucky Fried Chicken and the McDonald's. They don't have access to fresh produce. So this gets to that building process. If you don't have the right food to put in your body, how do you function? They have to go to a corner market to burn terrible food on a daily basis. So this place will have our own uh, restaurant and eating facilities will be open to the public. On weekends, we're gonna have farmer's markets, really you know, building as an impetus what we, we, we can do for the east side. Kind of the inside of what the facility is gonna look like, we'll have about 140,000 square feet of learning space. Uh, broken up into labs, and we're going to be teaching our welding, welding technologies, machine tool technologies, uh, electrical programs, industrial electricians, electromechanical. So that's the convergence of electricity and a mechanical device, robotics, assembly lines, that type of work. We'll also have uh, the industrial or the uh, utility to, uh, utility electrician, more of a high voltage, the guys who all work the power lines. Average wage in the in that sector is seventy-two thousand dollars a year, and you get there pretty quickly. Um, in all these sectors, you can go from your first two years of education. You should graduate with a two-year degree and be earning at least forty thousand dollars a year with little or no debt. There should be no debt coming out of this program. <clears throat> Within additional three years of work, you should be north of fifty-five to sixty thousand dollars a year in earnings. That doesn't include benefits. Another feature of this is in our sector, we have the lowest pay differential uh, and, and, and pay gap by gender and race. The only one that's better than us is education. So you're protected by a contract, the teachers are, and they're paid accordingly. The same thing happens in, in our sector. You're paid for your knowledge and your output and your capabilities. And you know, I think that's a very powerful message to show that you know we get it and we're paying the highest wages here locally with no subsidy typically from the from the state local or federal government some more renderings of what the facility is going to look like and my contact information if anybody would like to touch base any questions could you just talk about the dream and do it if you did i missed it Dream and Do It is a, uh, we are engaged with Dream and Do It. Uh, I'm the coordinator for Green Niagara County. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the tech team goes out to ECC, they do tech wars, they'll do engineering days. We'll be scheduling those visits between the manufacturers and the students. So the students, typically after engineering days, they go look at the, the college facilities, They'll then disembark and go out and meet with a local manufacturer and kind of see what's going on behind the door. Um, it's really our way of, of doing outreach. So our, our industry has become very proactive and industry partners will need to be in here talking to the students, talking to the teachers, talking to parents to address this skills gap. If we don't, we're done for. And if our manufacturing sector fails in West New York, West New York is done. We fund over, manufacturers fund over 
of all uh, state projects here and from a funding standpoint when you look at it from a tax base. So without a strong manufacturing sector, this, this region is really going to be impacted negatively. Well, I think the role of schools is always to educate their students so they're prepared for a career um, and, and prepared to succeed when they get out of here. I mean, it's not just book learning, it's the soft skills aspect. Are you going to be a good citizen? Are you going to function properly? And I'm, a, I'm an Eden resident. Uh, my kids have grown up here. I love Eden. I mean, I, it's, it, it's a very comforting uh, area. Eden is not a is not an issue for us. The places we love to hire, think about it, North Collins, Eden, Akron, Alden, all farming communities oftentimes where a number of the students have a mechanical aptitude because they work on a farm. They've had to function in their life. Uh, and they have great work that work ethic typically. So you know do what you do, but all we want is to promote the opportunities that exist. Um, the charter school for applied technologies in the city of Buffalo. Before they say the Pledge of Allegiance, the first thing they do is every day is career day. That's a K through 12 program. So the first announcement they make every day is every day is career day. And if you have that mentality here, and as you're educating children and, and trying to promote them and, and identify, there's a reason why you're here. And these kids have to build that we call the building the brand of you. Who are you going to be? You're a commodity. You are a an asset. And you need to show that and be proud of yourself and deliver yourself in a manner that is encouraging to others that want to pay you money for your brain, your heart, and your hands. So, you know, that's what I'd say we're looking for. Peter, thanks for coming. Um, I live this day in and day out. Um, I was at a Toyota facility Monday, and there is a gender gap. Um, basically, I was at the Raymond Fork Truck Facility down in Binghamton, New York, and there was female welders. And it's, you don't see a lot of it, but they're making a great wage. You know, they're in at 6 in the morning, they're out at 2 in the afternoon. Um, but this is real. What, what Peter's presenting is, is real. And, and what, the reason why I invited Peter here was, I happened to be at, at Colgate University here a couple weekends ago. 58 grand tuition and basically what do you come out with a liberal arts degree how are you going to pay off just 58 grand a year with a liberal arts degree and it's you know there's there's a real career here if this isn't a job this is a career and and what Peter's saying in regards to what's happening in the workforce is so true um, and, and, and we're, we, like, we're in trouble if, if this gap doesn't get filled. So, you know, I think all our students need to be exposed to this career that's out there. And it, it's not like the old day of you were working in, in Bethlehem Steel, you know, maybe that we thought of our parents worked in and stuff like that. You're working in some real nice facilities now. I mean, complete air conditioning, um, pretty clean places. So it, it's a career that, that you know people need to be exposed to. Yeah, creators are wanting. I think statistically, you should know the numbers. Only one third of the jobs in the United States require a four-year degree. So if you have more than one third of your student population going for a four-year degree, you're overtraining them. I'm not saying an education isn't important, but there's a pathway to a career. That, then they become underemployed. It doesn't require college. So people need to, if you're not looking at the New York City area, you're not looking at the U.S. Department of Labor Statistics and developing a business plan as a, as a board of education, you're doing a disservice to your customers who are the students and the, and the taxpayers. So that should be really addressed. I mean, heavily addressed. Uh, understand what those numbers are. Those numbers might be a little bit higher here from a town like Eden, um, but you know, what is your pathway? And what are the opportunities that exist? How do you assess the students? How do you help direct them? And how do you educate the parents on the opportunities that exist for their students, their kids as well? Um, my nephew graduated from 
Eden. Um, oh, sorry. My nephew and nieces uh, graduated from here. And my nephew went to a private college, in, in Allegheny College in Pennsylvania, and he graduated a semester early. And um, he just recently said, I shared this with the board, he says, uh, I just cost my parents a ton of money, and I don't have a job. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, he decided to uh, totally switch directions. I mean, the business background will help him, but he has now started a company uh, flipping houses. He loves working with his hands, and he said, I wish I would have went to a trade school. He says, I can't believe I cost my parents this much money. And so it was interesting coming from someone who, as, as my nephew, never thought would have wanted to do what he is doing, but he loves it. He's almost done flipping his first house out in Brant, and uh, he's just loving life. Where yeah. three months ago, he thought he was in the toilet because it's like, what am I going to do with myself? So. We're not trying to promote trade schools over traditional education. You have an incredible tech ed department here. Uh, in Canada, though, there's a tech ed department in every school. Uh, you have the Winnetia Association that, that they're members of, I think, voluntarily, um, and, and they get together. But there are both these opportunities as well. I know it's difficult for a community that's losing population to address this and it could affect your your teachers your funding um, but again I think if you have a plan in place and you can develop and implement a strategic plan that takes into account where the opportunities are today uh, that's the best service to your students one of the things that's always impressed me about Eden is we have such a diverse group of residents. We have many seniors who are going on to medical school and many seniors who could tear down a, a, a motorcycle engine since they were in eighth grade and, and rebuild it. And we should be always celebrate that diversity. Everyone should strive to use their skills to, mm -hmm. to forward themselves as opposed to go to college because someone told them to go to college, there, there's other paths. And this is uh, an, an excellent eye-opener to say there's other paths to uh, solid employment, um, consistent employment with, with really good wages. The only other factor that I, I've been around this now for five, six years is if there is a BOCES engagement, make the opportunity open to all your students. Don't be selective. Don't send the bottom third. We're paid wages that are higher than any other industry. We want the top third. So I think a lot of people oftentimes have a negative impression of what most these programs are. We've all heard the nicknames. We all heard the horror stories. That mentality has to change and I hope I was able to give you a little bit of direction. I to come back and then bring anybody that wants to go on a tour of a local manufacturing company to have that opportunity. Stop. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. sits down and then I'll okay are we all set all right moving on what's wrong I see it but I didn't put it up it just kind of came up for me so <laughs> so if that was a good meeting so I don't know where you store them, Lucy. Yeah, Team Drive. Team Drive. Okay. And then, go, oh, yours is, yeah, Board of Ed. And then, and then look for December. This right there. <coughs> there we go. 
Oh. There you go. I never have to go there. Okay. Are we ready? Yes. Yep. Let's go. All right. Any requests to withdraw specific items from consensus items? Going once. Okay. Item four, routine actions. Approval of consensus items. That the following consensus items be approved as listed in the administrative memorandum A through P. Second. Discussion or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. All right, this is the time that the board is designated to receive statements from individuals and groups. The board will review all statements and respond appropriately at a future meeting. All persons in attendance are required to sign the attendance sheet and designate their representation status, for example, parent, teacher, bus driver, chamber of commerce, etc. There is a two minute time limit. Anyone? Okay, yeah, come on up. Could you just use the mic though? That'd be awesome, <laughs> thanks. Sorry. I oh, know, I mean, know, I'm sorry. It's just really hard to hear in here. And what is your name? My name is Nancy Albers. Thank you, Nancy. Ninth grade here. Um, ninth grade. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, so we could have bought a house anywhere. We chose Eden because it's a tight-knit community. You guys were ranked in the top 15. It was a great fit for us. But since my kids have started here, you've been laying off teachers, dropping courses, done away with home monitors, the library is closed a lot, the library is not accessible after hours, and your ranking has dropped. These things you know. My taxes, however, go up every year, as you also know. I have never complained until now. I know that you guys have been trying to get rid of Pat McKenna for years, and for reasons I just can't even imagine. But if you let her walk out of this building on June 30th, you're gonna make a mistake of such gigantic proportions, it will take years to rectify. She is the heart and soul of this school. I don't work for the school, but I work in the building. I am here every single day. I am positioned right outside her office, and I have to tell you, she is the one who keeps this place in order. She is the visible face in the hallway. She knows every single student's name and their backstory. She is tough but fair. She is well respected by her students. And she goes above and beyond. She works late into the night and weekends. She is not a member of our community, but she is a vital part of our community. She has an outstanding relationship with the local law enforcement and CPS agents. She is an asset. If you were to bring someone new into here, the demeanor of these hallways would change. It terrifies me. My children, all the other students in this building, in this district, they are priceless. And I am saddened by the fact that you are willing to put a financial price tag on their education, their safety, and their future. And that's it. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, moving on to new business. Um, item A, resignations. Number one, accept the resignation, the recommended motion that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the recognition, the resignation of teacher aide Kelly Beller be accepted effective November 30th, 2017. The Board of Education and Administration wish to thank Ms. Beller for her service to the district. Second. Discussion? Jessica Kelly accepted a teaching position at East Aurora. We're excited for her. Terrific. Yep, good for her. Congratulations. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Uh, item two. Accept resignation that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the resignation for the purpose of retirement of bus driver Ruth Pirog mm -hmm. be accepted uh, effective January 3rd, 2018. The Board of Education and Administration wish to thank Mrs. Pirog for her 16 years of service to the district. Second. Discussion? She's done a good job. She's had some tough runs, too. Yep. Bus drivers always do a good job for us. <laughs> they, yes, do. they do. This yeah. is very yeah. true. Wonderful job getting everybody home. Yeah. That's crazy. Uh, seeing no discussion on that, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain, motion carried. 
All right, item B, appointments. All appointments will not be effective and service to the district pursuant thereto shall not begin until there has been compliance with statutory and regulatory provisions for fingerprinting, certification, and clearance for employment. Here are the recommended motions. Item one, appoint assistant district treasurer that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, Natalia Andrews, be appointed on probation as assistant district treasurer effective approximately January 2nd, 2018 through July 1st, 2018. Salary is $40,400. $40, Second. Discussion? Just that Natalia is here. We're absolutely thrilled that she wants to come to Eden. Um, her son was with her a little earlier, but I'm pretty sure he went home. So will you just raise your hand so the board knows where you're sitting? Okay. Congratulations. Seeing no more questions, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. Congratulations. 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 You don't have to stay for the whole meeting. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations. We'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you. Item two, extend appointment, that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the appointment of substitute guidance counselor Jennifer Dibble be extended through January 3rd, 2018. Salary is $95 per day, effective October 16, 2017 through January 3rd, 2018. Second. Any questions or discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Item three, appoint extended leave substitute teacher that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, Andrea DeMont, who is initially certified in students with disabilities one through six and childhood education one through six, be appointed as an extended leave substitute teacher replacing Mrs. LaMarca approximately March 1st, 2018 through approximately May 1st, 2018. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Item four, appoint full-time teacher aide that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, Michelle Smith, be appointed on probation as a teacher aide effective December 1st, 2017 through May 31st, 2018. Salary is based upon CSEA contract level four, step one. Second. Discussion? So Michelle would be replacing Kelly Beller. And Michelle is here. Too. Oh, thank oh, you yeah, for Michelle. telling me. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain, motion carried. Welcome, Michelle. Welcome. Item C, increase hours that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, hours for technology teacher Brian Smith be increased from 0.33 FTE to 0.5 FTE effective January 29th, 2018 due to the addition of a technology elective to be taught by Mr. Stephen Jones. Second. Questions? Well, that's a great night to do it after Peter Coleman coming. So mm -hmm. what I what I wanted to let you know is is that this is money from Senator Galavan's grant for Ag in the Classroom. And so Mr. Jones will be teaching agri agricultural production systems and Mr. Smith will be taking over Mr. Jones's DDP fourth period class effective second semester. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain, motion carried. Item D, approve accessing of textbooks that upon the recommendation of the superintendent out of date textbooks from Eden Elementary be declared excess and disposed of as the district deems appropriate. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. Item E, approve change in school building configurations that upon the recommendation of the superintendent effective July 1st, 2018, Eden Elementary School be reconfigured from grades three through six to grades three through five and Eden Junior Senior High School, grades seven through 12 be reconfigured to a middle school, high school, grades six through 12. Second. <clears throat> Discussion? So this is what the board has been working on since your original resolution to move forward with the capital project and the middle school. Um, I'm really happy to say that the high school had a wonderfully um, attended and very successful parent information night and they have another one coming up, is it January? No, yeah. Jeff, is it January? Thank you, Lucinda. And so having this resolution adopted by the board will allow me to complete the paperwork for the state education department, which is due before my March 1st, and then we wait for them to approve. Okay. okay. Do we know how long it takes them to approve? I'm hoping they get it done before June because we're <laughs> ready to roll. Well, they be but they don't let you do it too early, so it's really kind of, I okay. know. Okay. No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. 
Item F, approved minimum wage increase that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the New York State minimum wage increase from 970 per hour to 1040 per hour. The uncertified substitute rate will increase from $70 per day to $75 per day. Second. Discussion? Mm -hmm. we'll say anything All in it. favor? Wait, aye. aye. Let Lauren, Lauren uh, just for a moment. I just wanted to let you know that that minimum wage increase doesn't come in January 1st. It comes on December 31st. Oh, mm, okay. okay. So Can we add that to the resolution, Barb? I don't think it will matter for our teaching staff as we're off our winter recess at that point. Right. But yeah. anyone at support staff level that would be working would be increased as well due to the law. So December 31st? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. Okay, item six, information and proposals, the business report. Just in case you didn't get enough presentations from me earlier. The, this evening in your board packet, you all received the proposed Eden Central Reserve Plan. That will be on the docket for the January board meeting for adoption. But again, I wanted to go through one more time for you and for the public what a reserve plan is and where we're going with it. Actually, a reserve plan is a blueprint to how to save any access you might have in your budgeting process because if we budgeted strictly for the exact amount of dollars that the district were going to spend and left nothing in hopes of a small surplus, the district would never be able to absorb the many mandates that come from the state that we don't know about at budget time. Not to mention the fact that we are starting to budget now for something that won't start until July 1st of next year, so there's a, an opportunity for many changes to occur. So districts are working on, Eden is working on long-term financial planning. They're looking at the, we've looked at the current reserves. We're looking at what reserves we need to facilitate our long-range plans. And a process of developing the reserve plan has been going on with this Board of Education since the summer. So the investment plan or strategy to take and minimize the economic impacts on our taxpayers and on our students as we go through the budgetary process. We talked in the budget workshop tonight about the concerns with the state budget and the funding from New York State for our school districts. Long, without the use of reserves, districts would not be able to maintain the high quality of education they've been able to hang on to. And there would be much more cuts than we have seen in the past years. As our state aid is not being fully funded according to the um, foundation aid formulas, those were frozen in 0809. We did get some relief last year for them. We had a gap elimination adjustment for five years. These things would have negatively impacted the education even more than they have had not this district been prudent in their long-term financial planning. Now we're looking to create a f actual reserve plan that will be adopted by this Board of Education, reviewed annually, and readopted each year. So, so if I could just break in for one moment. For those of you who have been at other community forums, what would come out clear in those is that as a district, we receive approximately $1.2 million less each year since 2008. Um, clearly, that is some of the reductions that you've seen in staffing and in programs. Also, what we can go back and we can look at research to show that when the state of New York did contribute 50% in terms of aid for our district, I won't speak for other districts, is that it dovetailed into a lower in, a lower tax contribution by, by our residents and also was just the perfect alignment for programs for Eden. And so uh, our goal is to try to get back where we were prior to 2008, but it's gonna take the state of New York to get us there. Correct, and in the interim, we're trying to protect 
our district and our students against these economic roller coaster that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for fiscal stability. We're looking to offset the local share of major purchases, things like the capital project, buses, technology. And we're looking to improve our bond rating because, again, we don't want to pay higher interest rates. And when we look at ourselves as a business, a $29 million business, which is how we're looked at when we go out for bonds. This is the lens that they want to see. How are we planning for the future? What are we saving? Typically, if we were a business, this would be the owner's equity section, but this is our reserve section and our fund balance for a school district. So the purpose of our existing reserves, we currently have one for capital project, for the building, and then for equipment and buses. That it helps keep our equipment up to date for our buildings and maintenance area and our buses so our students remain safe on the roads. We have an employee benefit accrued liability which helps pay for sick time, vacation time that may have been accrued, things like that. We have a retirement contribution reserve which pay, helps us to save money to offset the cost for the employee's retirement system. That's our support staff. We're not allowed to save at this time. There is no vehicle for so that teachers. that was Don's question earlier. Yes, that's your support staff people. We have, we have to save for unplanned expenditures. We have to save for unemployment insurance. What most people don't understand is if when you work in the industry world, Every employer pays a percentage of their wages into an insurance fund to offset the cost in New York State and federally for unemployment insurance. In a school district, we're exempt from that and we pay our actual unemployment claims 100%. We have a reserve that is set up to set aside money for those costs. We have a repair reserve. That's for we use it typically here in Eden to, we have a co-gen facility that produces electricity. When that goes down, instead of the bump in the budget, we have this repair reserve that we can utilize to fix it. If a roof were to blow off or something else, we could go to that repair reserve fund. We could look at it two ways. We could look at it as we're going to borrow the money and put it back within two years, or we could hold a public forum and the board could vote to permanently remove those funds so we don't have to worry about repaying them and then replenish them in a year when we've done a little better on our budget. So these are the current reserves and I've kind of talked to you already about what they're for and how they're used. And these reserves, unemployment, retirement, and the employment benefit, accrued liability, those are with board authorization to utilize them. So the ones that we have to have the community's input on our repair reserve, which we're required to hold a budget a hearing for, and then our capital reserve and our vehicle reserve, which are propositions on our annual vote or separate vote for a capital project. So we're going to determine. We've determined the board risk. We've proposed. We're going to propose some new reserves, which. There's going to be one on there for proposition with the adoption of the reserve. And then we're going to develop, we've developed our reserve plan, we've reviewed it, and what's going to happen at the January meeting, hopefully this Board of Education will adopt the reserve plan that we've all worked so hard to create. Does the Board have any questions? Thank you. Anything in room or you? You don't have to, just ask. Um, I was just going to reiterate for those who had come. So I also wanted to just reiterate, we've presented our rollover budget. We've given a budget calendar to the Board of Education as part of that work. And one thing that I didn't mention in the budget workshop was that New York State is re is currently projecting a $4.6 million budget gap for 2018. So there's concern with what funding they will have. The Board of Regents this year asked for $1.6 billion in new educational funding. That's down from the $2.1 billion they requested last year. So already they're telling the governor and the legislature that we don't need as much funding. So it's important that any advocacy 
advocacy that can occur occurs quickly like so right that now. Yeah. yes so that they're getting that in their budget process you want to so jump in there Jen, Jen about what anybody in the audience can do right now I mean I've said it once uh, you just have to write I think the numbers and the contact on our website. information is still on our website yeah. you have to have your voice be heard it can't just come from boards of education and superintendents it has to come from the general public um, I said earlier the music and arts boosters put out a really nice simplified letter I think that's on our website too yes, it is. and you can just download it print it sign your name and mail it to any one of the contacts that are on there um, or all of them over and over again fax it <laughs> email it um, I mean they are listening and I, I don't think that they don't want to support us I just think they oh, yeah, they need to know that there's enough public support that they can push harder than they already are yeah. thank you Chad and that's the end of my report okay so in terms of, of my report, I just want to state that Senator Gallivan was here today. He's a huge supporter for Eden. We're thrilled whenever he comes by. He met with the boys' volleyball team and gave them a proclamation, which is a wonderful honor. He invited them onto the floor of the, of the Senate in Albany. It would be nice to be able to get them there. If our school was closer to Albany, that's where he would present it. Um, I told him if he paid for the bus, we'd absolutely go. Um, and we'd probably take a few more kids with us when we did go. He had a great conversation with the kids, and then afterwards he had a wonderful conversation with us about careers uh, upcoming. Again, the shortage in careers that we're talking about. Paul and I were just talking about that same shortage that we heard from Peter Coleman coming up in education. At, at the supply and demand in the next couple of years is going to be pretty scary. But he was talking about what he's seeing happening in Wyoming County and some of the dairy farms where, honestly, there's one person in an office watching a computer is all this automation takes care of the cows so the cows have a chip in their ear and they go to feed and that chip reads that the cow is there and opens up the gate without anybody being there then the cow walks forward to the what? next feeding station and that now they're standing on a scale and this wow. particular chip recognizes which cow it is how tall they are, how wide they are. One arm of the computer comes out and disinfects them and the other one zaps them with their um, milking apparatus and the farmer has sat near his computer the whole time. He said it's just fascinating to watch. So, um, you know, we're getting, it's, it's exciting to start to talk about all of this and realize that there's a direction that things are going for for our students. Awesome. And then in addition to that, I just really want to put a huge, huge thank you out for the last week first of all to our transportation department and Mary's here and she's generally up at four so this is a really big deal Mary you should be in bed by now um, as our head bus driver for transportation she and I uh, talk at four in the morning on weather days that are suspect and also to our building and grounds crew it's amazing if you ever have the opportunity to get out here before school to see this functioning of loaders and trucks and school buses and just what it takes to get the buses out on time and then yesterday we had was it yesterday that we had the early release yes. just to see what it takes to get all of our kids back into district that we have in, in so many different places in order to get our elementary school children out on time it's, it takes our high school kids leaving early and so my thank you is not just to the transportation staff in the building and grounds but also to the students the teachers and the staff um, students because they Twitter me like at midnight um, and give me all kinds of encouragement as to why the weather is <laughs> terribly bad the next morning <laughs> And to the teachers who the other day, when the roads were just horrible, were all here. And even though I was so worried that when Hamburg went down late and Lakeshore and Frontier went down Lake, along with, I think, Orchard Park and East Aurora, I didn't think we were going to have the staff and we had everybody. Uh, it was just incredible to watch. So it, it takes a, a huge effort to have this happen. We were not in danger with our kids. We brought them in. If in fact we had been, we would certainly have called a snow day. Uh, but in the end of the day, what we need to remember is, is that this is winter. 
and if we can get them in, even if we can get them in late, or even if we can get them in and we have to bring them home early, that we'd rather have our kids at school. Some of them don't have food at home, some of them would be alone at home, and many of them would be outside during the day anyways. And so, so our first goal is safety, our second one is to get them into school. Although there are four snow days, and I'm sure we're gonna use every single one of them if the lake doesn't freeze. And I think it's 42 degrees right now, so. I um, just wanna thank you for the text yeah. message at 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> we were thinking about thank you because I got my call at 6 a.m. that my school yes. was closed. I, 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 I just don't well, understand. For the text at 4 a.m. So that Mary said we have kids on bus. We have drivers out at 6 o'clock already. So for us to close at 6 is too late. Yeah. It's just simply too late. And so to base our closing on all those districts that are closing at 6 is impossible. We have to we have to know early. I just learned how to do the do not disturb on the group. Yeah, you want to definitely do that, because I'm going to let you know very, very early. And I invite the kids to get up at 4 o'clock, too, don't I, Haley? I'm like, let's check back at 4. That's right. I was like, I promise we won't be here all day. Yes. I t if they follow me on Twitter, they'll know ahead of time. That's right. Some it's, of us are up at 4 texting you, too. That's right. Yep. And Paul's like, tell me more, tell me more. So yeah, I'm always texting her at that time. <laughs> yeah, it works. So I, I love the kids. They, they crack me up. So, yeah, Adam or Kiki deserves a half a cake, not a whole cake, just a half a cake. So follow us on Twitter. You'll know at 4, 4.30 for sure. That's all I have. Okay. All right. I want to thank uh, the construction staff for finally getting the lights up in the parking lot. Oh my gosh, it was amazing yeah. out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that one down at the GLP is incredible, but the four out here is just mm -hmm. It's amazing, yeah. isn't yeah. it? They are great. So you know the delay was because FEMA confiscated our lights because of the hurricane, yeah. but they're here now. And um, barring any surprises at the high school this coming summer we have enough money left over in our in our regular construction budget to put more lights up at the elementary parking lot too which is pretty exciting which they're going to put them up around the uh, concession stand and the concession stand and another mm -hmm. one or two at GLP but every time you put lights where it's been dark your neighbors let you know so so we're we're working on adjusting um, that overflow of the lights at GLP right now Mm -hmm. I, well, I just want to personally thank the bus garage for handling my panicked phone call yesterday. And the GLP, Brenda was fantastic. And actually, Kelly took my call at the elementary school because I'm trying to figure out which bus route took my kids to FedEx Road so they could get off at my in-laws' house uh, because oh, nobody was home. Because we got off yeah. early. Nice. So everybody was great. And I just wanted to say thank you. And um, yeah. Thank you to the bus drivers. Everybody made it home, and they have a good. Job. They do. Yeah, oh, they do. They do. Yeah, they do. And, and sometimes the kids on the bus don't make it any easier, mm. you know, for distracting mm. them. And I tell the kids all the time in my classes, I said, let them drive. You let them concentrate on the road. They don't That's need right. concentrating on you. Mm -hmm. That's right. Anybody else? Yeah. 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 Anybody? Thanks. No. Like Nothing. Nothing's good. You Thank you for bringing Peter in. We'll get him oh. back to talk to kids and staff, okay? Yeah, yeah that was Anybody really interesting. Else, Cheryl? No? All okay. right. Okay. No school December 22nd. Elementary school completely closed to students and staff over the break in December. I'm going to text you at 4 and say I have to go to school. Then. That's yeah. fine. I'm <laughs> no they problem. The They're going to do the cutover from Cogen to the grid, but we'll still be running off the generator until February, and then in February we'll actually do the cutover for GLP, the bus garage, and the elementary school. So we'll be still on Cogen until February. until February. But if Cogen goes down, the elementary school will have power. Okay. Will the GLP have power also? No. And the after February, garage. they won't have it even if Cogen and the grid go down. So after February, because GLP doesn't have its own generator, if GLP, if, if the electricity in town is gone, GLP will be running off only a backup generator. Right. Um, but the other two buildings will actually have electricity and heat. Right. So we would end up closing the whole district because GLP doesn't have it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's right, Lauren. All right, future Good. dates, regular Board of Education meeting, Wednesday, January 17th, 2018, 7 p.m. in the Junior Senior High School Cafeteria. And now, motion to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Abstain? Thank you, everybody. Thank you.